Welcome everybody back into Nerd Sesh. As always, I'm Carson Breber and alongside me is Logan Camden. And today, with the NBA playoffs now very near, we are going to be ranking our top 10 contenders in the NBA. So Logan, as always, to start things off, who were some of your toughest omissions from this list? You know, as a closet Golden State Warriors fan, it pains me to mm. say that uh, they're not on my list. I, I had a long, hard... Shocker deep just thought about you know do i really think this team can get it done this year man i i, you I, I melodramatic hate, about I the hate, warriors dude. i hate oh leaving God. the warriors off the list man dude don't act like i want the warriors there man they're just fun they make it they make it interesting man but i i left them off my list that was one of the toughest cuts and then the suns i think the suns are just fake man those really everybody else i legitimately like give credence to a deep playoff run to a, a real title chance the the Suns and warriors oh. i i had to omit off my list um nobody else honestly like the pills the Cavs, the kings i really didn't consider much um Ooh. yeah the warriors and the Suns were my two toughest cuts the warriors by far i wanted to somehow delude myself again into getting them on my list and pretty high up on my list i couldn't do it unfortunately though yeah, you love those Golden State Warriors, man. I will say, not a particularly tough cut for me, but some of the other ones you mentioned, the Suns are a tough cut, even though I uh, do not like the overall construction of their basketball team, and I worry about if they can even reach the explosive ceiling of the elite offenses in the league consistently just because of the lack of volume three-point shooting or really consistent rim pressure. They still have Devin Booker and Kevin Durant, which is just a terrifying shot-making duo. Bradley Beal is still a high-quality third option. They still have solid spot-up shooting. When they've been dialed in, they've been a capable defensive team. Like, I don't want to dismiss the Suns. If I drew the Suns in the first round and I wasn't the Denver Nuggets, I would still be like, oh, man, that sucks. I don't want to have to play the Suns. Like, they still scare me. The Warriors playing good basketball don't scare me in that same way. There's just a lack of high-end talent and offensive creation alongside Steph. But probably my most painful cut was the Pelicans. And the reason that I think I can justify not having them here is just because we don't know Brandon Ingram's exact status. It looks like he is probably going to return, but we don't know if he's going to be 100%. And since he went down with injury, the Pels are just 4-6. and six. They're 17th in offensive rating, 18th in defensive rating. But when he is healthy, this team is just uncomfortable to play, man. They are big. They are physical. Zion, who has been more aggressive in the second half of this season, pretty much just gets what he wants. They have quality secondary star shot makers alongside him with B.I. and C.J. They defend at a really high level with Herb and Trey Murphy. They just have hounds out there. Like, the Pels are really good, but I worry about their offensive ceiling no matter what and especially if B.I. isn't 100%. So they're probably my toughest cut. And then the Cavs are this team that has had such an up-and-down season where even though it feels like they've rarely had all their pieces in place and been fully healthy, they had that stretch where they went 20-2 and two or whatever it was. But post-All-Star break, they have just been really struggling. They are 10-16 and 16 post-All-Star break, 20th in offensive rating, 24th in defensive rating, just brutal. And the biggest concern to me is Donovan Mitchell has only played six of the last 21 games as he's dealing with that knee injury and has not looked anything like himself. He's averaged 14 points per game on under 47% true shooting in that stretch. So without him at 100%, I'm just not taking this team to do anything in the playoffs. I still think that they have concerns in terms of their offensive skill in the front court, and they need probably Mitchell and Garland both to play at a really high level offensively to compensate for that if they want to even win one series. So those were basically my tough cuts. And with that, Logan, who do you have in your 10 spot? In my 10 spot is a team that would have been much higher on this list if we had asked this question probably two or three months ago. I have the Los Angeles Clippers in my 10 spot. Ooh. And uh, I want to give a big shout out to that boy, Paul George. Uh, been on an absolute tear. 39 piece the other night against Cleveland. And oh my gosh, Carson, that might be the most disrespectful like game winner you could ever hit, dude. That was disgusting. He's the note, bro. He's the nicest of all time. I That was the first thing I thought of when I saw the game winner. I was like, 
it, Paul George is so... Na- and, and, and it's not even like a push-off or, uh, you know, like like he, he influences Mobley in any way. Like, he actually dropped Mobley because Mobley had no idea where he was going, dude. He looked like a baby giraffe. Um, I mean, he drops both Cavs big men. Mobley falls on Allen. It's like a tower of dominoes falling. <laughs> uh, then on the other possession, you know, he stuffs Darius Garland. Big shout out to Paul George and what he's been doing. Like he's really been, and this is no shot at Kawhi Leonard, just in this recent stretch. Like he has been this team's best player, uh, shooting, handling the rock, man, just doing everything for for Los Angeles. Paul looks locked in, and you know I, I still believe in Kawhi too. You know I, I think that Kawhi, I think this has been kind of a load management stre- uh, stretch, like, and, and that's what makes it hard for the Clippers to really gauge, like. I don't feel like the Clippers have had their foot all the way on the gas pedal during this stretch. Oh, yeah. um, you know, I, I don't think they've been going super hard. And, and so that's why I still have a level and a modicum of faith here in the Clippers, especially with PG Kawhi as your two leaders and then the shooting ceiling. On the season, the Clippers are third in offensive rating and they're fourth in three-point percentage. And theoretically, like what this team can do in a playoff series with PG, with Kawhi, with Harden, with Norman Powell, um, you know, I mean, they could be able to shoot the lights out. Mm-hmm. There's just two things that really work against the Clippers and why I'm not as confident in them making a deep playoff run. One, they are on a collision course directly with the Dallas Mavericks, who I think Dallas is, one, the better team. I think they are, two, vengeful. I think this is a Dallas mm-hmm. Mavericks team that wants <laughs> retribution on this Clippers team. And I think the Mavericks have the best player in that series. Uh, I, I would not pick against Luka. I love the collective here in L.A. And the one guy bringing the Clippers really far down, and the guy that I just don't expect to pull his weight, I uh, spouted some of these stats on our last show. I have updated them for this last 15-game stretch. It's because of James Harden. Uh, over the last 15 games, Harden is 36% from the field, 29% from deep, 29% off the catch, on pull-up jumpers, 24% on open threes, 31% on open, uh, wide open threes, excuse me, and 16% from top of the key. I just do not trust James Harden whatsoever to pull his weight to reach any semblance of a a shooting, a scoring ceiling. And in this hypothetical series against the Mavericks, I think Dallas has good tertiary defenders to throw at Harden, you know, on the wings, if that's Josh Green, if that's Dante Exum, if it's Derek Jones Jr., if it's P.J. Washington, like, whatever, even if it's, like, Luka, you know, like, I think that they can competently guard uh, Harden. I think Dallas potentially has the size and strength advantage on the interior. Like, Big Zoo, that's going to be a tough battle, and I think this is going to be a great series uh, because there's a lot of great players on the court. But Mm -hmm. the Clippers have been playing worse basketball. They're also 25th in defensive rating over the last 15 games. Again, this is a team that I don't think is playing extremely hard, and I don't think they're fully locked in, but I also factor that in. So mostly it comes down to my lack of faith in James Harden. And just, yeah, I mean, this team hasn't been playing great ball, and the fact that they are going to draw one of the toughest first-round matchups in this playoff field against Dallas. I just think Dallas is the better team. Um, And if we do get a different James Harden for the playoffs— yeah, there's there's an opportunity, but I just don't anticipate it from what I've seen from him and from what I expect from him. He's the biggest swing factor to me for the Clippers, and I just have very little faith in James Harden showing up to the playoff party. Uh, and, and that's why the Clippers are lower, man. Uh, I, I don't think I could have them any higher than this. I have soured on the Clippers a bit. It's been a funny trajectory this year from when they made the move. I was like, I think they're still going to be around fifth in my hierarchy out West talking about the Harden trade. And then I resisted on them being the second contender out West for a while. But then there was a while when I thought this team is just humming, man, and they're beating everybody and they probably do belong behind Denver, still comfortably behind Denver, but as that next top dog out West and now They have just been struggling and have been playing mediocre basketball for quite some time. I do think a decent bit of that is connected to just lackadaisical effort in this stretch of the season for a team that is led by several stars in their 30s. They're just probably not going to play their best basketball in March and April, although it has been a prolonged stretch of mediocre basketball from this team. I have them a little bit higher. I think they are too talented to be all the way down at number 10. I'm interested in some of the teams who you have above them, but I have my list broken down sort of into tiers 
and we're doing a top 10 so they don't line up perfectly like i have my 9 and 10 in the suck to play in the first round tier and i would also include like the pels and the suns in that same tier I have the Clippers a level above that in my eighth spot because I do still see legitimate Western Conference final potential here because of the talent on this basketball team. And I tried not to really factor in matchup to my contender rankings because you're right. Like, they have a really bad first round matchup. I also think there are several teams who are super scary but are in the play-in for various reasons. Health, lackadaisical regular season effort. And so I didn't want to dismiss their status as teams even though they'll probably get bounced in the first round because they might be playing like the top two seeds in their conference. So I don't want to discount the Clippers. If Kawhi is healthy, they are still a big threat. And it's concerning that Kawhi has now missed these last four games, but also it's April. Lots of stars are missing just a few games. Teams are definitely erring on the side of caution as they should with their stars, especially when it's Kawhi Leonard. Because when that man has been healthy in the playoffs, he's just been unstoppable. Since 2019, a 30-point-per-game scorer on that stage on 63% true shooting. Unbelievable pull-up shooter who is so strong, who is so methodical that he just gets where he wants on the floor and then he doesn't miss, as I often say about Kawhi. So he is still a superstar player on that stage. And they still have alongside him two very legit star level on ball creators i'm a bit hesitant to put harden in that tier because of how bad he's been as of late but as a third option he certainly has the potential to be one of the more devastating in basketball and as a facilitator we know he's going to be super effective they are a lethal three-point shooting team very accurate from there both pull up and off the catch they just have big time perimeter shot makers they have the personnel to be a good team defense we've seen stretches where they don't have the ceiling to be a great team defense i think because of the lack of a high-end secondary rim protector because you can't consistently get top end effort from these star guys who are also carrying these loads offensively but man pg Kawhi as a perimeter trio zubats as a pure rim protector and interior rebounder that is a solid combination and i do like the top end of their bench quite a bit i mean norman powell and russ like those are guys who have relatively rare potential to swing a game and maybe even swing a series powell with his dynamic shot making russ with what he can do as an athlete pushing the tempo pressuring the rim and playmaking so those are the things i like the red flags are that for the last 25 games and you could even take it further back they've just been an awful defense 26th in defensive rating effort is certainly a part of that but I don't want to just go all in on, yeah, they're going to immediately flip the switch and be great there. Harden has been mostly quite bad as of late, and he is struggling just straight up as a shot maker, but we also saw last year, because of his limitations getting to the rim and finishing around the rim at this stage in his career, he is just inherently going to have some clunkers, some off nights, and this has been a really ugly stretch in exposing that. Kawhi also isn't healthy right now, and no matter how dominant he is, First two games of that Sun Series last year, he was dogging Kevin Durant. He was the best player on the floor by a mile. And there were some stars in that series. But if he only plays two games, it just doesn't matter. And that is still a concern with the Clippers. That's still a concern with Harden if he can maintain 100% health throughout a playoff run. And their reliance on perimeter shot making does still lend itself to some volatility. Although I love Kawhi's ability to get where he wants on the floor and not necessarily to the rim, but he's so damn good for mid-range and with those short-range jump shots that he can make those shots at a 55% clip and it's very efficient, consistent, reliable offense. But the team as a whole is going to rely a lot on those three-point shots, the pull-up threes for PG and James Harden, and that's been like the trend of PG's Clippers tenure. It's he is still this really impressive athlete, not as much as he was in his prime, but he really relies on those pull-up jumpers, and if they aren't falling, then he's just not going to be his most effective, and Harden has to rely on those shots. So we've just seen that bite the Clippers in the ass on several occasions in the playoffs before. They swing with their three-point shot, which is mostly going to be a good thing, but there is also some downside to that. So I don't want to say that this team can't make a run. Because I think if Harden gets his head out of his ass, if Kawhi is healthy and playing at the level that he can, if they engage defensively, we've seen the ceiling for that team. They're really, really good. They have that sort of potential. But we are just on a stretch of extended mediocrity. So I wouldn't have them down at 10, but I do have them in the 8 spot. 
because again i can't just expect like a full 180 right away even if we know that they have that sort of upside so in my 10 spot I have the Miami Heat. Logan, I have a feeling that you'll have them a bit higher. Oh, he's absolutely gobsmacked by it. He's absolutely shell-shocked. Keep Look, sleeping, man. Keep sleeping, man. Dude, well, you want to talk about matchups factoring in. They're probably going to lose in the first round because they very well might draw the Boston Celtics. And I think the Celtics this year are a little too much for them to handle. But I know it's the classic trope. Oh, my God, don't pick against the Heat because they prove you wrong in the playoffs. And fair enough. Fair enough, that's what they've been doing over these last four years. But I do think that this is clearly the least talented team that we're going to talk about today. What they do well, they are an elite team defense, and we know that that translates to the playoff environment. They dial in there. Jimmy is highly competitive. They have good dudes at the point of attack. Bam is just an absolute switchable monster who can blow games up. And Spolstra is a tactical genius who is just going to make teams uncomfortable and force them into their worst tendencies. They have a very proven playoff duo here. Jimmy just finds this level within himself that he never shows in the regular season. And bam, even if there are offensive inconsistencies and frustrations at time, he's just so damn good defensively that he is clearly showing the impact level of like mm -hmm. a top 20 player in these deep playoff runs. I also think, although they may be the least talented team who we're going to talk about today, they are more talented than last year. I think their wings are better than last year. Now... Those wings overperformed quite a bit in the playoff run. Caleb Martin decided that he wanted to be like a sub all-star level player, but the collection of Triple J, Duncan Robinson, who stepped up in a big way in last year's playoff run, but has just consistently been that guy this year, obviously still an elite shooter of the basketball, but improved ball handler, improved playmaker. Caleb maybe isn't going to be what he was in the playoffs last year, but he's a quality wing. Nikola Jovic, we have seen step up and has been starting, and I do like his playmaking chops, I like his shooting, so I like that collective group, and also, they have significantly better secondary creators than last year, where outside of Jimmy, you were relying on Gabe Vincent and his pull-up shooting, or you were relying on some of those wings, you now have due to our actual career bucket getters, like that's what they do with Tyler Hero and Terry Rogier, who aren't going to be the most consistent, who aren't going to be the most efficient necessarily, but they are guys who can get a quality shot for themselves and who are capable playmakers as well. So this is a more talented team. The red flags that I have with them and the reason that I don't have them higher on this list, they're still small and they're not very athletic. They're bigger than last year, but they're not going to get that easy offense that comes from having athletic advantages regularly. And defensively, they're going to be outmatched physically on the glass and just potentially positionally up and down the roster in certain matchups. So they have to grind and fight extra hard to offset that. And of course, the heat fight and grind, that's what they do, but it's still not out ideal to be outmatched physically consistently. They have not been a good offense this year, period, point blank. They're 21st in offensive rating and that was the case last year and they just totally flipped that switch and they decided to start making 45% of their threes but I do not think that is the most replicable formula. And even with Rozier and Hero, I worry about Jimmy having to go superhuman. And I worry about the Heat overall having to shoot the hell out of the ball at the level that they did last year. Or maybe not quite to that extent, but better than they have in the regular season. Like, I get that they pull their voodoo magic, but how many times can you go from a bad offense to a good offense in the playoffs? It's just not the formula that I am most comfortable betting on. And so because they are at a talent deficit, because they only have this one like clear star level shot creator, because they are small and undersized, I have the heat at number 10. I feel like that's still giving them their fair respect though. Like that's my number four team out East. I'm not saying that these teams that have been better in the regular season just automatically leapfrog them. I'm also not saying that they're going to make the conference finals every year. Your logic and rationale is very sound. I'm sitting here going, man, did I put on uh, the Nerd Sesh podcast from last year when we talked about the Heat? It's really the same thing. That's why I can't... I, I put very little weight in Miami's regular season numbers because I think that they are just a playoff team. I think you, you, you hit on a lot of key things. Uh, one there were outlier shooting performances from Miami last season that led to them getting to the finals. They were the number one three-point shooting team in all of the playoff field. 
They shot 45% from behind the arc versus the Bucks. They shot 43% versus the Celtics. And we know what it took for them to beat New York. That was not an easy series. They switched to a zone, and they basically said, hey, New York, shoot yourselves out of this series. And that's exactly what they did. Like, it just went their way. They somehow knocked off the much more talented Celtics in seven, right? And I still consider this team to be a real contender. I, I know you do too, and... I do think this is a better team than last year. That's a critical component for me. Uh, the potential return of Tyler Hero, uh, the trade for Terry Rozier really matters to me. Um, the addition of Jaime Jaquez is huge, and they still do have guys that can just get hot from deep. Uh, Hero, Rozier, Duncan Robinson is still here, man. Like They have guys that can, if they're in rhythm, they can shoot you out of a, you know, they can either shoot you in or out of a series. They, they're really big swing guys. I believe in playoff Jimmy, though. Playoff Jimmy is a real thing to me. He is a guy that just, when it comes playoff time, he's a guy I'm going to wholeheartedly buy into. And I think there are very few players in NBA history that can command a game in all of its phases like Jimmy. Offensively, defensively, on the glass. This may come off like an ESPN stat. I don't care. <laughs> Jimmy's playoff stat line is 26 and 4, 20.6 20 rebounds, 4 assists on 57% true shooting. There are only 6 players in NBA history that have averaged that stat line that efficiently. LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Nikola Jokic, and Luka Doncic, and Jimmy Butler. I mean, that's really good company to be in. And I fully buy into Jimmy. I have the Heat at number 6 on my list. And the reason that I have them this high. I agree, Carson. They're going to draw one hell of a first-round matchup if they get in. If that's Milwaukee, if that's Boston, it sucks. But you know what? They're one really big upset in the first round away from being in the exact same spot they were last year. And I would pick Milwaukee in a, a series because they have Giannis and Damian Lillard. And I just don't expect a monumental collapse the way we did last season. But the Bucs are a flawed team, too. I only have the Bucs oh, yeah. one spot above Miami. I don't think there's a very big difference between those two teams for me. Uh, I think that's going to be a really hard series. And, again, I would pick Boston to beat them in a seven-game series. Uh, again, I, I just think Boston's a better team. But I think Miami can hang and make them uncomfortable. Uh, I do think Boston's talent advantage is, is too much to disregard, but Miami does have that voodoo magic, and they have the coaching edge, they have a dog edge, and they've got two superstars that you can rely in. Like you said, man, they have that playoff pedigree. So I I'm not going to count out Miami. I think that if they can somehow pull off their voodoo magic in a first-round matchup, I would much rather them draw Milwaukee. I think that yeah. is a much more winnable series for them. And if that happens, I mean, Miami's right back in the mix to – make another crazy, stupid, nonsensical run again this year. Uh, I think it's going to take more voodoo magic. I think it's going to take hot shooting. I think it's going to take playoff Jimmy and Bam locking up uh, the opposing team's best player. But we've seen it too many times for me to not have them high on this list. So that's why uh, they're at number six on my list, man. I, I think Miami's a, wow. a real contender. Yeah, I don't want to diminish it, but I'm just and, not going to bet on it happening again. Like, what's more likely? They, they push the Celtics seven or they get swept by the Celtics? I don't think they get swept. I'd say seven, honestly. I, I don't think they get swept. I don't by think Boston. they go seven. Um, yeah, I wouldn't the, pick the, them to get swept, but they're just at such an overwhelming talent deficit yeah, in the matchup. Like and, that. and that's why I think the one big swing factor, and this is really tough, I think the one guy that swings uh, this playoff run is Bam Adebayo. Um, what he can do offensively and how he can impact the game. He's a 36% jump shooter, 35% out of the mid range. Um, you know, he's just not a reliable, you know, super consistent offensive player. I think it's going to mm -hmm. take Bam. We saw it in the finals last year. You know, we're going to need Bam to step up. Uh, he's a good touch guy, but, you know, it's not consistent, easy offense for Bam. And I think he's going to have to take a step up for them to make another run. But I would never count Miami out, man. I would, I would never count Miami out. All right, you've learned your lesson. I haven't learned mine. Jimmy, go ahead and do it again. Pull off some more crazy uh, Jimmy magic, heat magic. So who do you have in your nine spot, Logan? At number nine, I have the Oklahoma City Thunder. And, you know, I oh debated. Oh, my God. Yeah, I debated between having OKC uh, or Golden State. And I want to be clear about something, too. A, a big fundamental component of why I have 
like a team like Miami above a team like Oklahoma City is because of the path. That does factor in here to me. The East has one big dog that I think you really have to knock off, and that's Boston. I'm not saying I'm not scared of Milwaukee, but, you know, the West, you've got to go through Denver. You've got to go through L.A. I think Minnesota is a much tougher out. Like, there's just the path is going to be way harder for Oklahoma City, in my opinion. But, uh, but Logan, first round, the Thunder are probably going to draw the Suns or the Pelicans. The Heat are going to draw I mean, the Celtics or the Bucks. They could draw L.A. I think Oklahoma City's path is going to be really tough. And honestly, I don't know. I like Oklahoma City's playoff. or I like Miami's playoff pedigree a little more too, man. Um, Oklahoma City was a tough team to, to gauge. I, I love their offensive creation. I think they've got a ton of creation, man, especially SGA. SGA literally just put up this season. It's the fourth most efficient 30 point per game and six assists per game season in NBA history. Nearly a true shooting of 64%. The other seasons up there, 2024 Giannis, 2016 Steph Curry, 2023 Damian Lillard. I mean, Shea Gilgis Alexander is having one of the most prolific offensive seasons ever. You add in the fact they got Chet Holmgren and Jalen Williams around them uh, to help float the offense. It's crazy. And there's a dog aspect with OKC, man. When they're at full strength, this team plays hard. They're top 10 on both sides of the ball. But there's two factors working heavily against them. It's size and it's inexperience. They're 28th in rebound rate. Carson, over under 50 total playoff games played on the uh, on this roster in their rotation. Uh, let's think. Who has any at all? Lou Dort, SGA... Those two together get you to what, like 18? I'm going to say under for sure. It's 48. And get this. It's only because Gordon Hayward's oh, Gordon played Hayward, 29. Yeah, I wasn't it's, even factoring in. He's the lion's share of it. It's because Gordon Hayward's played 29 playoff games. And this is just the rotation. This isn't the, the guys that don't normally get a ton of burn. SGA and Lou Dort are the only guys that have legit playoff experience. SGA has 13 games. Lou Dort has six. This is not a... Now, I want to be clear about something. Like, this is not an argument against Shea Gilgis Alexander. I think SGA is, despite his inexperience, I think he is primed to have a really good playoff series, playoff run. I just think he's a guy game to game that you just can't stop. He's going to do and get whatever he wants. He's so damn consistent. This is an inexperienced thing. This is an overall size thing. And again, the path, man, I just think it's really going to be tough for me to envision. Oklahoma City knocking off a Denver or knocking off a Lakers. It, it's it, it's hard for me to envision. And, uh, yeah, I think the East is a lot lighter. I think that's a big reason of why I have Miami higher than uh, Oklahoma City. I think they're comparable in playoff ability because of my faith in Jimmy and Bam. But I do think Miami's going to have an easier path. They have to pull off one big upset, and I think the West is just tougher, grittier, and deeper. Um but Oklahoma City's way ahead of schedule. They're going to be here every year, man. Every single year, they're going to be back. They're going to keep gaining playoff experience. And specific to this playoff run, I mean, I can't see SGA just being the best player in a playoff series, winning the first round, making it tight in the second round. But I just can't see them knocking off one of the top dogs off West. And that's what limits them from being like a real finals contender to me. Wow. I'm just not sure that that makes sense to me. Like, if you want to say can't see them knocking off Denver, I get it. I think that's a really tough matchup. I know they won the regular season series, but that is where it's like, okay, your lack of size is just going to be exploited by this overwhelmingly huge and skilled team, and you have nothing for Jokic. And I think the Lakers are a problematic matchup. And uh, I like the Lakers in that series, and I think I would pick them. I can't say that. I can't visualize the Thunder beating them, though. It's harder for you to visualize the Thunder beating the Lakers this year than the Heat beating the Celtics. Something about Miami, man. No, dude, I think it's something about Miami, and also, you're just underselling how good the Thunder are. We had this conversation last week. It was a shocking moment in Nerd Sesh history where we were talking about the Warriors, if they were to draw the Thunder in the yeah. first can round, I, can I and you said you would take that? them. Can yeah. I strike that from the record? Okay, you're striking that. Fair enough. <laughs> but what you really want to strike is no, no, when no, no, I no. then said, that hold on. I said, hold on. Happen. 
You had the Rockets over the Warriors mm. last week by the transitive property. Would you take the Rockets over the Thunder? And you said Dude. maybe. And I almost walked off the show. Fortunately, I wiped the CCTV footage. There's actually no recordings of it. So we're good. Yeah. All right. Congratulations. I guess you've saved your reputation through government censorship. But I'm <laughs> just wondering if you're overstating their playoff concerns and completely underselling just how damn good they are at basketball. Cause this is a team that is 53 and 25. And that's been with SGA and J dub missing the last few games. And so they've been dropping games. I have them at number six and I was kind of like, that feels low, man. I don't know. They're just great. They're a great basketball team. Again, J dub and SGA have both missed the last four games with nagging injuries. I don't love that, but Teams are being conservative with injury management at this point. I understand that, so I'm not freaking out about it. SGA is a top five player. He's the most consistent scorer in basketball just in terms of his floor. He gets where he wants the floor. He is one of the best alongside really just Luka Doncic in terms of perimeter creators getting themselves a shot. Pick and roll isolation and his variety, his ability to do it in and around the paint where it's so consistent is incredible. He's just a dominant, dominant basketball player. J-Dub is a pretty ideal secondary creator, just a hyper-efficient shot maker who also is a good playmaker and is such a shifty athlete. He's so hard to stay in front of. So you have that combination of rim pressure and pull-up shooting from both these guys. Chet is the ideal modern big man, phenomenal play finisher, big target around the rim, elite shooting big who's also a skilled ball handler and playmaker. Like when they've run Chet pick and rolls, which they can do, they can basically invert anything in this offense. Anybody can be the ball handler. Anybody can be the screener. Everybody can shoot. Everybody can play make. I think on like 70 Chet pick and rolls, including passes, he creates with 90th percentile efficiency or something. It's stupid. And then defensively, he's an elite rim protector. But they are just modern basketball utopia realized pretty much they have this incredibly lethal five out brand where they play fast and they have great athletes in transition but in the half court like i said everybody can handle everybody can shoot everybody can play make they have these two devastating downhill guards who you can't stay in front of who can also kill you with their skilled shot making who are these great drive and kick decision makers and creators and that's just really hard for teams to stop man there's not a lot of teams out there who have anybody who can stay in front of J-Dub. And then SGA is like J-Dub on steroids, dude. It's just ridiculous. And defensively, they, on the perimeter, defend very well. They have a bunch of long, rangy athletes. And Chet is an elite pure rim protector. He's been one of the most effective in the league there this season. They are the only team, other than Boston, who is like this all-time juggernaut that is top six, both in offensive rating and defensive rating. An incredibly balanced team. I also love their sixth and seventh men. Kaysan Wallace and Isaiah Joe, both guys bring me big time shot making. With Kaysan, I get that defensive grit. I get that playmaking. And it's worth noting that they do have red flags. One of them to me has been Josh Giddy all year. I am just out on the archetype of non-shooting, poor athlete, poor defender. Obviously, like that's just not a player who's going to be successful in the league no matter how good of a passer they are but post all-star game he has been way better for them like he felt unplayable for a lot of this year post all-star break he's giving you 14 and a half seven and five and a half on 60 percent true shooting that's an eight percent improvement from pre all-star break and he's knocking down his threes at a 39 percent clip He's finishing better at the rim. He's hitting his floaters more. He just looks more confident and comfortable in every way. So he still freaks me out. I'm still out on J Josh Giddy. Like, I just think about certain matchups. Teams are going to be perfectly happy to leave him in the corner. And then that disrupts the drive and kick element, right? And you're basically playing four on five if he's not knocking down his wide open catch and shoot jumpers to keep them honest. And even attacking closeouts. He's a limited athlete. His touch for the most part this year inside the arc hasn't been very good i do not like josh giddy i made a video about it earlier this year but he's been playing better and if he is going to knock down his wide open threes and if he is going to be a more efficient scorer inside the arc then you're not like oh my god get that dude off the floor and then you do start to get some of the benefits of his passing value so that's one red flag still for sure and the other thing is gordon hayward has just been super underwhelming and hasn't consistently got on the floor and i felt when they made that move for him 
this is going to be your giddy replacement in the playoffs. This is a guy who brings a lot of the same playmaking value, but is a better athlete, is a more capable scorer inside the arc and a more capable shooter. And uh, he just hasn't delivered yet. And I'm not sure if we can expect him to. As you mentioned, they are very young. And uh, that manifests itself in the fact that they are physically an immature team. I mean, they are playing super small ball to begin with, but Chet also is like 190 pounds. And so there's the capability for other teams to bully them there. But I also think mentally, it just matters. There's just a consistent track record, no matter how talented you are. There's a reason that the Thunder didn't make their deep run i'm talking about the kd russ harden thunder here in 2010 2011 they make the western conference finals but 2012 is when they're finally over the hump right it takes a couple playoff runs and of course the young guys are improving but they're also just maturing and adapting to that stage so that lack of maturity matters to me both physically and mentally and they're just very small they're 28th in rebound rate and there are certain jumbo sized teams out west that i just think have the ability to bully them the Lakers, the Nuggets, the Timberwolves. But there's a reason that this team is still beating almost everybody, man. And it's because they're more skilled. It's because it's really hard to guard a team when you can't stay in front of their guards. And they're also great playmakers and shooters. And the guys around them can shoot. And they have a bunch of high-level passers. And they're going to defend their asses off. And they're athletic as hell there. And so I just don't want to undersell that. So that's why I have Oklahoma City at number six. Of course, Miami is way more playoff proven. But... This OKC team hasn't had a chance to show us what they have on the playoff stage. This is the first time that they've been a team of this caliber, and uh, I'm not the highest on their ceiling this year, but I still think they're better than you're giving them credit for. Yeah, no, I mean, they're great. I just think they're ahead of schedule. I just don't think this is the year. I don't think they get it done. Like, Well, they don't get it done. I'm not picking them to get it done. I just think number nine, you're going to have some teams above them that I'm going to disagree with. I'm prepared for that. Okay. At number eight, I got uh, I got the Philadelphia 76ers, and uh, I started prepping for this show. We were going to do this last week. We wanted to make sure that we had, you know, the most information on teams. We were playoff ready uh, when we did this pod. I wouldn't have had the Sixers on my list. One, I didn't know what Joel Embiid was going to look like, but now that he's back and we've seen, you know, three games of Embiid, uh, I can't have them off of my list. Now, mm-hmm. Uh, Embiid in his return, 28 points, 7 rebounds, and 4 assists on 50% from the field, 46 from behind the arc, uh, with 64% true shooting. Uh, He's averaging 5 turnovers per game, uh, but over a steal and a block. And again, this is about 28, 27 minutes a night. Uh, You know, they haven't been playing him the whole game, too, but uh, luckily they haven't needed him uh, for the entirety. I've really liked Carson. You tell me what you think. Uh, You noticed... Uh, last week when we did the show uh, with Embiid's return, you know, you talked about him and how much slimmer and slighter he looked. Uh, mm-hmm. I have liked him condition, conditioning-wise and mobility-wise. Like, he looks decently agile. He's moving pretty fluidly. Um, the one thing I've noticed, you know, Embiid's not the most, the best vertical athlete to begin with, but I, I, there's not been a ton of pop, like like less than normal. You know, you would fit in. I mean, that's, you know, that's as expected. Um you know, there's not he's not as explosive. Uh and, and Embiid's not the most explosive guy, but there's definitely a little bit of a lack of that. Uh and he's also just settled for the jumper a lot. And I know Embiid is really dependent on his jumper falling. You know, it's just a tenant of his game. And when he's hitting, it's like an unstoppable shot. Like Embiid has some of the best post footwork and just ball handling ability from any big man I've ever seen. It it really is ridiculous. Like the way he moves out of triple threat like it's it's guard like his footwork the way he just deceives defenders it's really impressive but I would like to see him get downhill more uh and try to get to the hole and it does worry me that on a playoff stage if Embiid is continuously settling for the jumper and it's not falling that he could just kind of lull himself in this offense into bad tendencies and bad possessions um with that you know, just getting back up to game speed, playmaking wise, is a big concern. Um, feel for the game, knowing where to move the ball. I do think this is a talented Philly team, and uh, even without James Harden, I think this team is better this year than they were last year. Uh, uh, surrounding components, you know, Embiid mm-hmm. obviously not being at a hundred percent factors in. You know what I mean? I think the surrounding talent is better than last year. Uh, I would take 
where Harden was at and Embiid at 100% uh, last year, but I like having Buddy Heald here. I like having Kelly Oubre. I like having Tobias Harris. Like, these are meaningful guys that if they're shot and they're scoring, uh, you know, I mean, they can help swing a series. The biggest swing guy is Embiid. Uh, just, you know, what we get offensively and defensively. He's a playoff underperformer. Uh, he averages four less points, four, uh, one less assists per game. He averages three less free throws, and he averages more turnovers in the playoffs than he does in the regular season. His three-point percentage has dropped by six points. Uh, his true shooting has dropped by three. Like, it is a real concern, and that's what I think holds uh, Philly back. I, you know, I, do, don't, I don't think that Embiid is at 100%, and I think that's going to hamper Philly's big expectations. In that same breath, I, I do like having Tyrese Maxey as a number two. Just had another 50-piece. Carson, he's got three 50-point 50 uh, point games Crazy. this year. Uh, he's only, only 11 players in NBA history have more 50-point games in a single season than Tyrese Maxey. That's Nasty. insane. Um, but that is what holds him back. You know, I think that Embiid, I just think it's a huge burden on this guy to have come back midseason from such a major injury and to expect mm -hmm. him to play not just not even at a hundred percent, but to expect him for this to be the run, for him to go above and beyond and to lead mm -hmm. Philly through a cutthroat, uh, you know, to over a Boston Celtics team, over a scrappy Miami team, over Miami, I just or excuse me, over Milwaukee too. It's it's a lot to ask for me from this Philly team uh this year. I think Philly is building towards something. I think they are building to a deeper run. If it's next year, if it's two years from now, I like what they're building, especially bringing in Nick Nurse, bringing in these other guys that I like, Oubre, Heald. Getting Embiid healthy is the most important thing for this Philadelphia team uh, in the long run. And because he's not at 100%, and because I don't expect him to exceed expectations, and because I think there are limiting factors with this lingering injury, I don't think Philly can really get through the East. But I think they're a really tough out, man. There's a ton of offensive creation here. It's still Joel Embiid. And if his jumper is hitting, if we can get... You know, because even though I say that... Let me ask you this, Carson. Even though Embiid's not at 100%, do you think this could potentially be the best playoff run of his career? It's definitely possible. It's not that high of a bar. You have the one year in 2021... It was when he like actually played pretty well offensively throughout, but then also still didn't have the best to finish to that run. That was the disappointing loss to Atlanta. I do think it's possible, but this is again why I'm not factoring in the path to my contender rankings. I think the third and fourth most dangerous, scariest teams out East are in the play-in, and that's the Sixers in the Heat, who aren't even guaranteed to get into the playoff field. You certainly think they will, but... You could just have a couple clunkers in a row, which means they're going to be drawing the Celtics and the Bucks, who I do still think are the two best teams out East. So it's not the best path for them to have a deep run. Like they've just had much more favorable seating, but I do still like this team. I have them at number nine. And in terms of regular season success, this has been the best year of Embiid's career when he's on the floor. They're 29 and eight when he plays this year. And the reason they do have to be on this list somewhere the reason i have them above miami because we talked about this last week like who would you rather avoid in that first round i just think philly is the higher ceiling i am very confident in miami's ability to make you uncomfortable to out coach you to hell but the sixers just have a potential superhero on their roster and that's something that miami doesn't have i know you love jimmy jimmy is not capable of what joel Embiid is capable of he's not capable of averaging 35 a game efficiently and also dominating the game defensively like we've he did seen that. Embiid i mean do. he did that nope he's never done that he's In never a playoff done that. series yeah he did that against uh, Milwaukee okay, a last series year. a series joel Embiid did that for 40 games this year bro has Embiid done it in a playoff series you think I'm some Joel Embiid defender here? Okay, great. Give your Jimmy over Embiid take. Let's see how that plays. Well, I'm not going to do that, but, I mean, Jimmy's – my thing is just Jimmy's shown us. Jimmy showed it last year, and, I mean, he averaged over 30 points per game back to – or not back-to-back -back series because we had the Knicks series where he got hurt. But, I mean, two 30-point-per-game playoff series last uh, last season efficiently. No, he didn't have two 30-point-per-game. He totally – 
fell off or was the after Boston, he twisted his ankle. Or was maybe it was the game seven in 22. Boston, he didn't really play all that well in that series. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Milwaukee went absolutely berserk. But that's five games, Logan. Like, I, I give all the respect that is due to playoff Jimmy. I think he's one of the two biggest playoff risers we've ever seen. Shout out Reggie Miller as well. He's just not Joel Embiid. This is an asinine conversation to be having. Embiid is capable of physically dominating everybody and then also being one of the best skilled shot makers well, on the planet. And considering the fact that he's not at 100% and has never shown us on the playoff stage, that's why I would rather take Jimmy in Miami for this playoff run. You would rather have Jimmy than Embiid? For this playoff run, yes. I still don't agree, even though I don't think that we're going to get the best version of Embiid. I mean, he's looked good since coming back, but... I wouldn't say is in the form that he was earlier this year. There's just a different ceiling there. And with him out there, this team does have quality wings with the Batum and Ubre additions. They have a star shot maker on the perimeter. Maxi obviously has had his efficiency issues with Embiid off the floor, but with him on there has been pretty stellar and has had these just explosions. As we saw the other night, you mentioned the 350 pieces this year. So, at the end of the day, like that's why there are 29 and 18 when Embiid plays. The results have been really impressive. I don't view them as favorably in the playoffs, though. That's why they're not in my top three contenders because the concerns are you need Embiid to get to that absolutely absurd level fast. And I just don't want to bet on that considering his health track record and his playoff track record. Also, I mentioned this last week, but we don't know if or when DeAnthony Melton is coming back. It seems weird that he's just been in like this sort of a prolonged absence and so I'm not expecting him to and if he doesn't then I don't like the depth here quite as much I think he's an impactful two-way guy and ultimately this team just isn't the most talented alongside MB. like Maxi is going to have some inconsistencies compared to these other teams lead perimeter shot makers Tobias Harris is going to have inconsistencies in the scope of third options Ubre is going to have these stretches where he's not knocking down his spot up jumpers so like you said I think that they are still a year or two a move or two away but I wouldn't want to face Joel Embiid. I understand what he's done in the playoffs as I always talk about I called it out big time before last year but I still wouldn't want to see him like he's just a, a dominant basketball player. He has that sort of potential at any given moment. So I have Philly 9. I have LA 8, which we've already talked about. Who do you have at number 7, Logan? Number 7 is a team that I didn't know if I was going to have them break my top 10, actually. And Ooh. that's the Minnesota Timberwolves. I went back and forth with where I was going to have Minnesota. Um, Whoa. And I would hear Minnesota honestly being higher on this list, too. My fundamental concern with the Timberwolves was Carl Anthony Towns is going to be out. And I thought that was... No, he's not. No, he's not. He's well, coming back. And that was why oh, I thought sorry. that, you know, this might be a, a ship that gets capsized, right? You know, they ball in all season long, great regular season. And so for two reasons, I think Minnesota maybe has a real shot to, to make some noise. Uh, one, the fact that we might see Cat back for... Uh, the playoffs is that confirmed that he's going to be back for the first round as of this morning they're pretty confident he's going to make a regular season return so it seems he's going to be back like this week maybe that's massive i even had minnesota here before that because of a man named nas reed seven letters <laughs> nas reed n-a-z-r-e-i-d if we could cue the music man god i mm. love that song i think nas reed could have floated them if they needed for a series or two. Um, but, I mean, with him, if Cat is even close to what he was at full health, the Timberwolves are dangerous, man. Nas Reed is a problem. Like, since Cat got injured, he's putting up 19.7 boards and two assists on 61% true shooting, 48% uh, from the field, 44% from deep. That's also 40% from everywhere behind the arc. Corners, wings, top of the key. Nas Reed is wet from everywhere. Um, he's just so talented for such a big guy, man. He can attack closeouts. He's slithery in the lane. He's a good playmaker. He's a really underrated athlete. Like, at 6'9 and that heavy, that dude has got bounce. Um, oh, yeah. He's, he's fast. Nas Reed's the man, dude. He's a little bit of a limited at-rim finisher, but he's got really good touch, too. Um I, I love Nas Reed, and I think he is critical to the Timberwolves doing damage in the playoffs. But I love the construction of this team top to bottom. 
They're physical. They're long. They've got great defenders. Anthony Edwards, Jaden McDaniels, uh, Nikhil Alexander-Walker on the wing, too, has been a menace defensively. Rudy Gobert anchoring the interior with Cat coming back. They're just a long, strong, physical, athletic team. And then on the offensive side of the ball, you add in the fact that they have got Anthony Edwards, who I think is going to be a playoff riser consistently. You know, um, with his physical abilities and then with the ceiling that I think he can reach as a jump shooter, Cat as the secondary option is so lethal to have. Uh, and he's so much more developed uh, than where he was in his younger days. And with the Nas Reeds of the world, with my con- like, I, the, the Timberwolves are just a really good team, man. And mm-hmm. I, I do think there are offensive half court limitations. They're a league average uh, half court offense. And that holds them back ceiling wise. But Minnesota can go toe to toe with any team out West. I think they can hang with the Lakers. I think they can hang with Dallas. I think they can hang with Denver. They can make all of these teams uncomfortable. And I think with a healthy Carl Anthony Towns, man, I'm talking, I'm kind of talking myself into maybe bumping Miami down a spot and maybe bumping them Minnesota boys up. Yeah. I might do that. I might bump Miami to seven, and I think I'm going to bump Minnesota up to six. I, I love what Minnesota is built, man. And they just match up. They are a matchup problem for every team in the playoff field. With a healthy Carl Anthony Towns, this team could could really soar, dude. I yeah, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna bump Miami to seven, and I'm gonna bump I'm gonna bump Minnesota to six, dude. I I really like what Minnesota has built here, and uh, I think they're a problem, man. I think Minnesota's a problem. They are a problem. I've got them all the way up at number four, and what they have done in this stretch without Cat has been impressive. The offense hasn't always looked perfect, but it didn't always look perfect with Cat. They're still 10th in offensive rating in that stretch. First in defensive rating, of course, and they have a 10-3 and record. And they're in position to get the one seed. Like, they control their own destiny because they have the tiebreaker over Denver. And what makes this team so damn good and what makes them so uncomfortable and scary for any team to face in the playoffs is that they're not just the best defense in the league there is the biggest difference between them and the second best defense that we've seen in the league in terms of defensive rating in 30 years the last team with a margin that big between number one and number two was the 1994 knicks by the way different league but the principle has always been you have to be a good half court offense basically you have to be a top 10 offense and defense to make a finals run to make a title run that's always been the standard that was a team that with a very average offense still made the finals and very nearly won it all because they were just that great defensively the formula for minnesota works against anybody they have absolute hounds at the point of attack man Jaden mcdaniels Nikhil alexander walker dialed in anthony edwards kyle anderson with his length like they just are going to give you trouble on the perimeter. And then they have the most dominant pure interior defender in basketball, I would say, who is more than capable of switching out onto the perimeter and guarding in isolation and guarding out in space because of his absurd length. And he's just so smart. And that is Rudy Gobert. That is a formula that against any matchup, you think about, all right, can they deal with teams that are quicker and play in space? Yes, they did a good job against the Clippers throughout the regular season. I think that they really, because of how good and athletic they are on the perimeter, can hold up in those settings. And then against these big teams, nobody is better equipped to make them uncomfortable. Against the Denver Nuggets, we saw it in last year's playoff run, even with a shorthanded Timberwolves team. We've just seen it consistently. Their ability to guard Jokic in the post with Cat, who is still a really big body, and then have Gobert in that Roma role. Of course, there's no solution to Jokic, but they guarded him better than anybody else in last year's playoff run, and I think can guard him better than anybody else. They just have elite size overall. They are capable of bullying people physically. And with Cat, they have two stars offensively, and they have a big mismatch attacker who can also just bully those small teams and so now they're dealing with problems on the other side of the ball and i really really like the top end of their bench you only need eight guys and they have a very solid top eight like Nas, Nikhil alexander walker and kyle anderson off your bench is pretty freaking stellar dude and you gave Nas his props i think he's averaging 18 and 8 efficiently since cat went down like shout out to him bro offensively he's just a stud so 
Those are all the things that I love about Minnesota and why I have them even higher than you. The red flags are still that they aren't a great offense. And historically, I've always bet against teams that haven't shown that they can produce really high-level offense, especially in the half-court in the regular season. It's why I've been out on the Grizzlies for years. I just haven't bought into that half-court offense. I do think Minnesota is a little bit better equipped for those situations, even though they might not produce the same regular season offensive rating because those Grizzlies teams are far more up and down in these slowed down, physical, grinded out playoff environments. Minnesota has real physical advantages and they have good spot up shooters alongside their two star creators. So I don't think that they're like incapable in those settings. I think they can get enough uh, to rely on their all time defense. Like, let's be real. This is one of the best defenses we've seen in a long time. The other red flag, if Cat isn't himself, he's coming back. But if he is a little bit banged up, if he's a little bit hobbled, I don't like that offensive formula enough. And Ant, as much as I love the guy, can't carry that load single-handedly. Since Cat's injury, the Timberwolves team offense has held up, but Ant is scoring with just 54% true shooting. His efficiency is taking a hit, and ultimately... He's too inconsistent as a pull-up shooter. He can have these red-hot stretches, but he's been one of the least efficient volume pull-up shooters in the league. So I still like him in a playoff environment because of his overwhelming athletic advantages in that pull-up shooting ceiling, but it's not the most consistent. So that's the only reason I can't have Minnesota higher than this. Everybody else just has much clearer paths to effortless offense, to just dominating you on that side of the ball. But I think Minnesota's defensive advantage offsets what everybody below them may have in an offensive edge so i have them at number four the nba season is in full swing and when i can't get enough of the action on the court i spice things up by betting on DraftKings sportsbook an official sports betting partner of the nba and right now new customers bet five bucks and get 150 dollars instantly in bonus bets and north carolina listeners don't forget DraftKings sportsbook is now live in your state download the DraftKings sportsbook app now and use code nerds new customers can bet five bucks to get 150 dollars instantly in bonus bets, only a DraftKings Sportsbook with code NERDS. The crown is yours. Now we're all the way back to my number seven, which is the Milwaukee Bucks, Logan. Interesting that after all your Bucks slander, I actually have them lower than you in my contender rankings. They're still number two for me out east. I just think it has become increasingly clear that the west is way better. The bottom end of the east is really weak, but also like outside of Boston, dude. I just don't see, like, that real high-end contender. I think Boston is going to waltz through the East this year. Since hiring Doc Rivers, Logan, the moment of doom, the Bucks are 15 and 16. They're 15th in offensive rating. They're 14th in defensive rating. This is just a thoroughly uninspiring basketball team right now. Watching the Knicks game yesterday, and by the way, shout out to the Knicks. I should have mentioned them as an honorable mention, even without Julius Randle. They're still very much in that sucks to play in the first round category because they're going to grind you up defensively. Brunson is averaging 34 points per game over his last 13. The load he is carrying is ridiculous, and I don't want him to have to sustain that. I don't love that. It speaks to their lack of a second creator, but my God, I trust that dude in the playoffs. So I would not want to face the Knicks, but in that matchup, Brunson is just toasting Brook Lopez out of high pick and roll. And we've seen the issues that him sitting and drop consistently in these playoff environments can present, but he's also not agile enough for him to guard in space. And so that's a problem. He can be a really effective regular season defender, not as ideally built for the playoffs. Also, Hartenstein was just floating them to death out of those drop looks. Also, of course, no guard could stay in front of Brunson, who isn't the shiftiest, quickest guard. A lot of his work is going to be done with sheer craftiness, but still he was able to drive quite successfully against the Bucs because of their weaknesses at the point of attack. It also just felt like New York cared way more, and they were just making more high-effort plays. They were on every loose ball. like They were just making exceptional plays defensively with their hands, stripping the Bucs, and Milwaukee just never really got them back in that way and when I look at the pieces outside of Giannis Giannis is doing his thing now specifically in that game I thought Nick the Knicks did a good job on him and specifically OG in the second half but he had his stretch where he was getting whatever he wants offensively this year he's been incredible Dame we know 
has been far more inconsistent than we would have expected and still scares me if I'm an opposing team in a playoff environment, but not at the level of Dame last year who was giving you a 32 a night on whatever it was, 65% true shooting, like one of the craziest scoring seasons ever. You're not getting that Damian Lillard. You're getting a Damian Lillard who has struggled more in terms of getting to the rim and who has struggled more in terms of his pull-up shot making. Brooke Lopez is the least effective as an interior scorer that he's been. I have seen enough Dame Brook uh, pick and pop actions to last me a lifetime, man. It's stagnant, it's repetitive, and uh, there's just a lack of that rim running element that could really unlock what Dame could do as a half court creator a little bit more. As an interior defender and a rebounder also, I think Brook has taken a step back from recent seasons. Chris Middleton, I just cannot bet on being healthy. I cannot bet on carrying the load as a third option offensively that they need him to, nor can I count on him athletically and as a rebounder being what they need from a forward. So there's just a lot of red flags with this team. Slow, old, not defending well, uh, mediocre rebounding team, even though they're supposed to have these size advantages. And yet, in spite of all that, I still bet that they make the Eastern Conference Finals just because I think the East is weak. It's just lack of, inti they just have a lack of intimidating teams. And when Giannis and Dane play together, this team still is 43 and 21. They're still a top five offense this year for a reason. That's still clearly a top three duo in basketball and they can overwhelm most people, especially if they do really tap into the Dame Giannis pick and roll. Praise be the day that happens. I'm not fully betting on it, but like that would be pretty unguardable, especially because they still have good spot up shooting alongside them. They're still top five and threes made on a 37% clip, but all of their issues this year have gone unresolved and remarkably have arguably just gotten worse and worse and they've been playing their worst basketball as of late they've lost four straight now a couple of them just to bad basketball teams so i'm out on the bucks man i'm out on the bucks and yet i still think they make the eastern conference finals but this is an incredibly disappointing team they're not like the 2013 lakers when you look at oh my god splashy offseason and then you limp into the playoffs but i was just wrong about this team i thought this team could win the title and not just that, I thought that they were like the front runner or the co-front runner at the very least. And uh, they just have glaring issues. And unfortunately, Dame was not a human flex seal for this team. So I have them all the way down at number seven. Yeah, I don't necessarily disagree with uh, anything that you said. And the only reason that this Bucks team is at number five for me is because they play in the East. That is the only reason. Um, and maybe yeah. you're right. Maybe I should have considered I, – Path did come into play here with a lot of these rankings. But, like, yeah, as a team, I would hear an argument, yeah, for, for lower about where you had them. But, again, like you said, I clearly think they're number two in the East, even with all their flaws. And I have been a Bucks detractor and doubter ever since Glenn Doc Rivers was mm -hmm. uh, instated as the head coach here. And uh, I viewed him as a fundamentally limiting factor – for why they couldn't get it done. And to be clear, I don't think the Milwaukee Bucks can get out of the East unless the Boston Celtics suffer an injury. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're at five, is because I don't really view anybody else out East as real competition. And if that breaks their way, I could somehow see this super flawed Bucks team just creeping into the finals out of basically sheer luck. Um, and not mm -hmm. just sheer luck. I mean, Giannis and Dame, obviously, are going to have to go superhuman. That's, But that's it. You know, it's so funny because, ironically, like, the Bucks put all of their chips in on Damian Lillard. And I don't blame them. Yeah. That was the right move to make after the season that Damian... Damian Lillard just had one of the greatest, most efficient 30-point-per-game seasons of all time. Like, I don't even disagree with the move to do it. I think that was I the right was move. home run. Yeah. And so... But that's it. That's all they got. Brooke Lopez has fallen off a cliff, like you said, man. Chris Middleton, uh, you just can't trust. Doc Rivers, you can't trust. They didn't address their point of attack defense. They got Pat Bev. Like, the Bucks just simply have not changed throughout this season. To quote Dennis Green, one of my favorites, man. They are who we thought they were. Yeah. And all the Bucks still have at this point in the season is Giannis and Dame. And... If you really believe in the Bucks, that's the only reason you believe in them. And again, the only reason they're number five on my list is because of the comically weak Eastern Conference that we have here. Uh, and that's why I say I don't think the gap between them and Miami is that big. I don't think the gap between New York and them 
is all that big. The East is just yeah. weak. And, uh, yeah, and a big shout-out to New York, man. That team is going to be – I wish I had shouted them out in my honorable mentions. That team is going to be a really tough out uh, regardless oh, yeah. of, you know, of, of health. That team's just going to scratch and claw. Um, I'm disappointed by the Bucks, and I would be utterly astounded if this team got to the finals uh, with Doc Rivers. Yeah, it's not just Doc. Let's not make it that. Doc certainly doesn't help, but they have a lot of issues. But, yeah, I just can't say that I would be shocked if they lost in the first round because you're going to draw probably Miami or Philly, man. Those are tough first-round matchups, and you're a team that is playing bad basketball now with bad vibes, and you need your duo to just carry you. That's what you need. Yeah. So I see your argument about the path. Again, I'm just basically looking, looking at mm -hmm. how good are these basketball teams. And I just think, like, the Thundermen play way better basketball. The Timberwolves play way better basketball. My number five, my number five, I think is playing better basketball when it matters. And I actually like their playoff formula a little bit more than what we're seeing from the Bucks right now. So you have Miami at six. Mm -hmm. You have Milwaukee at five. So I guess it is my turn to get into my number five. I know you're going to have him even higher, Logan. I think you sick bastard. You sick bastard. You and this team, you have an emotional roller coaster of mm -hmm. just a love every, story. Every day, man. Every day. Every day. You don't know how to feel about them. I have the Lakers here. And I've been high on the Lakers all year. I thought coming into the season, they were the second biggest threat out West. I thought after the Nuggets, this was a team that had just been to the Western Conference Finals and had maintained their level. And I think that I missed on several of their off-season moves. I, first of all, liked the Christian Wood move more than I should have. I liked the Gabe Vincent addition. He obviously has just barely played this year, so tough to really evaluate that. But I think I underestimated the loss of Dennis Schroeder, his point of attack defense. So overall, this has been an underwhelming regular season team. But... I would not want to see them in the playoffs, man. And I think when it has mattered this year, they have shown us who they can be, and it is a damn good basketball team. They're 38-26 and 26 when LeBron and AD both play this year, which isn't, like, ridiculous, but that's a pretty damn good basketball team. Since February 1st, they are 21-9. and nine. And who is playing the best as of late matters, Logan, especially in these recent years when we have seen increased parity league-wide in a post-Warriors era, post-Warriors world. I personally think this year, there's a bit of a reversal to that at the very top because I think Denver and Boston are way better than everybody else, but it's not like in the mid-2010s when in the West you had the Spurs and the Thunder who were like these juggernauts outside of the very top dog, that being the Warriors, and then you had the Rockets. There's just like a lot of good teams. There's a lot of good teams out West, but I don't think there's a great team outside of the Denver Nuggets. And... So we've seen last year, the Lakers, mediocre, most of the regular season, but post-deadline, they made the moves, they got that roster lined up, and they had the best record in the West post-All-Star break, then they make the Western Conference Finals. 2022, the Mavs were a mediocre team for a lot of that year, ended as the four seed, best record in the West post-All-Star break. So if you are dialed in and playing your best basketball, we've just seen that trend out West when things are more even up and down the standings, that it matters. They have two top 10 players. That is always going to be a really meaningful formula. It's the same reason that we can view the Bucks still as contenders at all, even with all the issues that they have. When you have a duo of that caliber, those guys can carry you far. And we've seen it with LeBron and AD. We saw them win a title in 2020. Different versions of both of them, of course. Clearly better versions of both of them. But without the most inspiring supporting cast, because they were just overwhelming. This team is also huge, which I like, and they're especially huge when you have Ruby Hachimura in that starting lineup instead of Torian Prince, which they've been doing as of late. But when it just comes down to the value of LeBron playing significantly better basketball this year than last year, much better as a jump shooter, healthier, and we know that he can just pick his spots and get whatever he wants, attack mismatches, brutalize you with his physicality, kill you with his playmaking has this single game ceiling that is just overwhelming and AD can absolutely ruin series defensively. And that was the backbone of the run last year. It was okay. AD is just going to absolutely wreck the game with his rim protection, with his ability to guard in space, with his ability to affect pocket passes with his hands. And if Jared Vanderbilt comes back, which is ambiguous, it doesn't look great right now. It seems like he's still a bit of a ways away, but they can be an elite defense. Like, they were the best defense in last year's postseason. 
I think Minnesota is going to be tough to compete with this year, but outside of that, they can probably be the best in the field. And so then they have this elite team defense, potentially. They have one of the best duos in basketball, top three, in my opinion. And D'Lo and Reeves are a pretty damn good combo of secondary shot creators. They combine for 34 points and 12 assists per game on 60% true shooting. So when LeBron takes his foot off the gas and isn't going to just be this ball dominant heliocentric player that he was back in Cleveland for full games. We know he's not going to do that. These guys can float the ship. And by the way, for two series last year, that was a good formula. Then D'Lo collapsed in the Western Conference Finals, but I do think he's a better player than he was last year. And I really believe in Austin Reeves. And there's some specific two-man actions between a Reeves and LeBron that are just really deadly. Thinking about what they can do with ghost screens for LeBron, hunting switches for Austin Reeves, getting open from three off those actions. And I do like the fact that Rui is starting now because he's just way better than Torian. He's proven himself to be an elite spot-up shooter over this last year, plus 43% from deep, way bigger, way stronger, better rebounder, better athlete, much better at creating his own shot. That's just a no-brainer to me to be starting Rui over Torian. So the ceiling this team has shown when they're engaged against good teams in this late push, in the in-season tournament, like that's looked like an elite basketball team. And they are very experienced And as I mentioned, specifically in that matchup against OKC, like, I don't want to disrespect the Thunder because they've just been so much better throughout this year consistently, but that's a brutal matchup. And uh, even though I really like the Thunder's big three, like, the potential for LeBron and AD to just overwhelm them is tough. They've actually guarded OKC's guards relatively well. I think they can bully them on the glass and in the interior overall. So in that matchup, that's kind of why I have LA at five and OKC at six. And also against the other really big teams out West, the grown men teams, jumbo sized, physical experienced like Denver, like Minnesota. I think LA is just more physically capable of matching up for sure. The concerns with them, consistency, obviously, been an issue throughout this regular season. It was an issue even throughout last year's playoff run. They just laid down some clunkers. And their path this year is going to be tougher no matter what. Like, you're not getting a team as flawed as the Grizzlies without Steven Adams and Brandon Clark last year. You're not getting a team in the second round as flawed as last year's Warriors team. Like, you're going to have to go on the road and maybe you get OKC in the first round. Even that would be way tougher than either of last year's series in my opinion. But if not, it's going to be the Nuggets or the Timberwolves. You're losing to the Nuggets. I still would pick the Timberwolves in that series. And then after that, you're going to have to play the Clippers or the Mavericks. Like, even though I think the Lakers are really good, I don't expect them to replicate last year's Western Conference Finals run. I think there's a very, very real chance. And just when I do the various permutations, they're probably going to lose first round. But I still think they can put up a better fight than a whole lot of other teams out West. And so that's just kind of their own doing. That's what you get for not playing good regular season basketball. You dig yourself a hole. You have to play the best teams early. That's not good. The other concerns that I have beyond just consistency point of attack defense. If Vando isn't healthy, that's been a problem for this team. It's limited their defensive ceiling. The Reeves and D lineups are not good for that. I do still worry about D'Lo just doing his act where he's like, all right, what if I took a bunch of tough pull-up jumpers and I missed them all this time? I don't like that. And LeBron and AD, this kind of ties in with the consistency, but just holding up at that superstar level over an entire playoff run, LeBron physically, AD physically too to some extent, but also just with his offensive level and assertiveness. This team has concerns and they are less proven clearly in this regular season than a lot of the other teams who we're talking about. But the good moments have been really good. The playoff formula has been proven. And I really like the basketball that they have been playing for the most part as of late. So I believe in them. Joke's on you, buddy. They don't need to win the uh, playoffs this year because they already won the in-season tournament. They're already going to raise a banner. banner. So it doesn't matter. Uh, This is going to flow nicely. I have the Lakers one spot higher at four. Uh, yeah, uh, Vando to me is the X factor for this team and what they can do uh, if he's out there. You know, again, he's maybe limited offensively. He can lock up the opposing team's best perimeter player. You put LeBron in a little bit of a rover role where he can make plays, AD on the backside. It's a really good combination. Um, and you already mentioned D'Lo, Reeves. I trust them. I trust LeBron and AD. Again, maybe not consistency or effort-wise, 
uh, but I trust them over the course of a playoff series. And then I think they got guys who can swing a series. Uh, you shouted at Hachimura, who I think is a, like you said, dude, a no-brainer start at this point. I don't know how many mm-hmm. how many times can we read metrics about Tarian Prince or Jackson Hayes and keep throwing them out there, man. It's like, those guys suck. Play Roy. Roy balled out in last year's playoffs. Roy balled out the other night, had a 30-piece. He's You know, there's just more volatility with Roy. And another guy whose volatility could help or hurt L.A., Spencer Dinwiddie. You know, I'm not the biggest Dinwiddie guy, but, I mean, he's a pretty good third guard to have in this rotation just in terms of length. In you know, if you need him in a pinch and he's on, he can help out. You know, I thought in Brooklyn it was dumb. I thought they really handicapped him to what he could do as a lead ball handler, and I think this is a better situation for him. I'm not expecting him to go out there and swing a series, but he's a good rotation player to have here in L.A., Uh, I had high hopes coming into the season. I picked them to win the title preseason. I anticipated big midseason moves uh, that didn't happen. I anticipated them playing better ball as the season went along. A lot of it didn't come to fruition, but they've been better post-All-Star break. They're a big physical team. Uh, They're going to play great defense. They're going to rebound well. And again, like you said, they got two superstars. So there's a wide range of outcomes for L.A. There's a you know, a way they get to the finals, there's a way they get bounced in the first round. Uh, I still believe in L.A. like you, Carson, and that's why they're number four, man. There's, they got La Sunshine, man. There's a way. There's they a do. way. They have LaGlorious King. I don't really know if there's a path for them to the finals. I just can't see them beating the Nuggets. They just get dogged by the Nuggets, man. And I mean, what's their advantage in that matchup? They don't uh, really have one. It, injury luck. Yeah, injury luck, I suppose. The miracles. La Sunshine is praised by the basketball gods and touched with their holy water to have this be his undeniable goat moment. It would have to be something like that. The Lakers, I still think, are really good. And uh, it's funny because it's just so, so possible that they don't actually make any meaningful playoff noise because of how seeding is shaken out, which is totally their fault. Mm-hmm. But I can just see the waves of people saying, Lakers overhyped, Lakers overhyped, and it's like, you know, nobody's going to beat the Denver Nuggets in the Western Conference. So if they lose to the Nuggets, if they put up a good fight, obviously it matters how they look. You can't just discount their basketball ability. So I have the T-Wolves at four. I do slightly prefer them to the Lakers, even though I think the Lakers have – a higher offensive ceiling and I still think they can be really good defensively and I think the other scary thing is the Lakers could easily have the two best players on the floor in that series I mean they have the two best players on the floor unless Ant goes crazy Mm -hmm. but the collective of what the T-Wolves have built they just have so many good basketball players who are so much more reliably good I would say and I think that they can really Give L.A. some trouble defensively. I think they have really good defenders at the point of attack. I think that Gobert uh, gives A.D. some trouble. Really, uh, physically, is not somebody who A.D. can have his way with. So, I lean Minnesota because of that and the consistency of what they've put forth. So, at number three, Logan, I think we have the same team. Why is it the Dallas Mavericks for you all the way up in the three spot? Well, I... It starts with Luka and Kyrie, right? You just have two overwhelming offensive pieces that can just churn out great offense, great shots for our teammates, and can just fill fill buckets, man. They're number two in clutch offensive rating this year, man. Like, in the Mavericks in a tight game, I, I trust them to, to close it out. Uh, specifically recently, though, after getting Gafford lively, like last 15 games, this team is number one in defensive rating. Not only did that move make them more talented, skilled, and give them size and athleticism, I think it energized them. You know, I think it was like a a shot, you know, to this team that just fired them up, that got this team ready. Like, wow, you know, we have a real shot. I think it is, uh, again, not only just translated in terms of better ability on the floor, I think it's just energized this team and given them some kind of fire that, not that they completely lacked, but... They're just playing harder. Um, Gafford is an awesome, awesome defender. Him and Lively together are such a dominant interior duo. And, you know, I love the shooting surrounding this team too, man. I think that they've got guys who are reliable and guys who can swing series. Exum, small sample size. You know, he's only shooting two a night, 50% from behind the arc. Josh Green is over 40% from behind the arc. Uh, 
You know, you got Jaden Hardy and Tim Hardaway Jr. Tim Hardaway Jr. can swing a series. And then, you know, you've got physical athletes on the wings too, P.J. Washington and Derek Jones. I just think that they're really complementary. You've got good size, good athleticism, uh, a great defense behind Kyrie and Luka now. I, I, I think a lot of people are just really sleeping on Dallas because of their seeding, man. And, you know, that's the thing with L.A. too. It's like, well, if they're such a great team, why does the record not reflect it? Well, you know, it's just... How it goes sometimes. I, well, I, that's how it goes when if you're the Lakers, you don't try a lot. And if you're the Mavs, you overhaul your team midseason. And you, and you lock in. Yeah, and they yeah. Have, they've done that. Uh, Dallas is the second scariest team in the West to me. And in a hypothetical series against the Nuggets, I think they get beat. But damn, is that a good series. And that's what I'm hoping for. I don't know how it's going to shake out with standings or if that's even possible. You know, we could see uh, – Dallas and Denver in the second round if it shakes out. Seeding is going to be really important in the West, uh, to state the obvious. Mm -hmm. But uh, if Dallas can avoid Denver until the Western Conference Finals, I think they could make a run. And I think, I think not, I wouldn't say anybody poses like a real problem for Denver, but I think Dallas has the best punch against them because they have Luka and Kyrie. Um, I really believe in Dallas, dude. I think they are a super scary team to play. Yeah. I have the Mavs at number three as well. And I do want to be clear, the gap for me all the way from three to eight is not that big. Mm -hmm. It's really just not. Like, those are the teams who I view as conference finals caliber, where I can see pretty clear paths to them getting there, and they all kind of have their respective flaws. Dallas's big advantage over Minnesota or over LA is just that they are so capable of exploding offensively. And I absolutely love the duo at the top end here and the shot creation that you're getting from Kyrie and Luka. Obviously, they went insane against Houston. Kyrie had 48, Luka had 37, 9, and 12. But that's what they're capable of doing in a series. Luka is going to grind you up. He's going to get a good shot every time out of pick and roll in isolation for himself or a teammate, or he can bully specific mismatches out of the post, and Kyrie is just this otherworldly shot maker, 79th percentile isolation score, 80th percentile pick and roll score, who can just go berserk in a series too. Like, there's not a scarier offensive duo in basketball right now, in my opinion, outside of Jamal and Jokic, when you're talking just about the offensive side of the ball. And they absolutely nailed the deadline. Mm -hmm. We both love what they did at the deadline. Called them out as big winners of the deadline, but I just look at where I viewed them when they made the Kyrie trade to where I viewed them coming into this year, and my opinion of them has just grown so dramatically. They've just repeatedly nailed the moves around their star duo, and it's been super impressive. Since Gafford and PJ debuted, they're 19-7. and seven. They're fourth in offensive rating, seventh in defensive rating is the big number, and 13th in rebound rate whereas they were 29th before they traded for Gafford. Their interior defense, their athleticism in the front court has just transformed. They just look like a different team on that front. And I specifically want to give credit to P.J. Washington because especially as of late, over these last five games, he has been aggressive offensively as a play finisher, get into his floaters, knocking down open threes, and he's been productive. He's averaging 19-7. and seven on 66% true shooting over his last five. And he's been erratic as a shooter this year. He hasn't been the most efficient throughout the season, but that version of him is a difference maker because that's kind of the one thing for the Mavs. It's like you need that third guy to consistently step up offensively. And THJ can do it just with his shooting, but PJ does it in a way where you're also getting size and you're getting defensive value because he has been just really good there since he joined the Mavs. Super long, athletic, engaged, good hands, just making plays on that side of the ball. So Gafford obviously was a great pickup, but PJ has been really shining as of late. Dude, I just wanted to say, like, it's really remarkable to me when these, like, good players, you know, you can finally get them in a winning context or next to a mm -hmm. superstar. Like, I, I think he's in a different tier as a player, but, like, Aaron Gordon, when he was in Orlando, and then you send him to Denver and you put him alongside Jokic, and it's like, Oh my God! I mean, this is a match made in heaven, and yeah, it, it, context is so so important when it comes, you know, because PJ could be doing this in Charlotte, and you're asking him to do all these extra things that right. he's not equipped to do. But you put him just in this 
you know, exclusive role, and he's thriving. It's, it's, it's really cool to see, man. And uh, I don't know, PJ's a beast. PJ is a, a huge component too of of why this team can make noise. Yeah, but the buy-in is also really important. You have guys who are talented, but they never buy into the role, and so they never really succeed. And PJ deserves props for that. But when he is on the floor with Kyrie and Luca. This team has a plus 12 net rating. Like, that has been a very, very good trio to have on the floor. And then with either one of your bigs and then with a just solid wing shot maker alongside them, it's just a really good formula, man. The two elite shot creators, the spot-up shooters, these athletic forwards, these really good rim-running bigs who defend at a super high level. And this team has quality depth. I'm just in. I'm in. And they're surging at the right time. So... I don't really have concerns about them in the same way I do about the Lakers, for example, in the same way I do about the Thunder, even as good as they are, because it's like they still have Josh Giddy, and Josh Giddy might still get played off the floor and they are still super young and they are still super slight and small. The Mavs, I know Luka's going to go crazy. I know Kyrie's going to go crazy. This team has one of the highest three point shooting ceilings in the league. And I know that they're going to defend well right now. I legitimately believe in what they're doing consistently on that side of the ball. I know they're not going to get bullied. They may not be the biggest team, but they're significantly bigger than they were and better in the front court. I just give the utmost credit to what this front office has done in terms of team building and, of course, these players for executing. But we've been saying it for a bit now. The Mavs do feel like the number two team out west. And if somebody's going to beat the Nuggets as well as the Timberwolves may be able to guard them. Can they hit the offensive ceiling? Because I just don't think you're really meaningfully slowing down that Denver machine no matter what. You might slow them down by 8%, but if you still have a suspect offense of your own, that's not going to be enough. The Mavs, it could be, we just go absolutely insane. We're just shooting the lights out. Luke is getting wherever he wants and having one of his insane three-point shooting series and we can hang enough on the glass and we can hang enough on the interior and there's upside there that I don't really see with anybody else out west. Well, and you remember we've talked a, a myriad of times about their matchup earlier this year and how Dallas was able to really dominate the offensive glass and the glass in general. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's going to be a discrepancy like that, but that's kind of the thing with Denver. You hit it on the head. You're not going to drub Denver. Yeah. You're not going to no. just straight up beat Denver. You got to hang with them. And then you got to slam the door. And I think Dallas is very well equipped to hang with them in basically all phases of the game. Yeah. Shout out to the Mavs. I still think there's definitely a gap between the yeah, two. Yeah. I think Denver, first of all, has the best player, but also uh, just that collective starting five. Like they have specialists who are so good at one damn thing, every single one of them, and they are so cohesive. They fit like a glove, man, just like OJ, your favorite. So. <laughs> There's a gap there for sure. And, and I think there's a gap between the top two teams. Just like period, point blank. They're in a different tier. I felt that way for a long time now, man. Yeah. If we don't get a Boston-Denver finals, I am going to be disappointed. I'm going to feel let down. I mean, the regular season preview that we got a few weeks ago was amazing basketball. Mm -hmm. So who is number two for you, Logan? Nerd says try not to make an OJ joke challenge. Impossible. Impossible. Literally impossible. And I won't even try. I have the Boston Celtics at number two, and I'll get into why here in a minute. I, I want to emphasize how dominant Boston has been this year. Mm -hmm. They have the third best net rating in league history in a single season. That's behind the 96 and 97 Bulls and just in front of the 2017 Warriors. Like, the Boston Celtics are historically not just great, Historically dominant, one of the greatest teams of all time. Right now, mm -hmm. they're 62 and 16. Like, this is a collective of one of the, uh, this is an amalgamation of some of the greatest basketball talent ever. Tatum, Brown, Porzingis, White, Holiday, Horford, it's an all star team. The Celtics have assembled an all star lineup. And I don't hate their depth either, man. Pritchard and Hauser no. off the bench aren't bad. Uh, the addition of Xavier Tillman, I've liked. The Celtics are great. The difference to me between these two teams, because we've all been talking Boston and Denver. All NBA basketball media has been slamming Denver-Boston this entire time. And my justification every single time when it comes down to Denver and Boston is their star players. 
Who do I have more faith in at the end of the day, Jason Tatum or Nikola Jokic? And I wouldn't bet against the big Serbian. Tatum has gotten a lot better this season, Carson. And you mentioned it a couple weeks ago when we did our uh, players pod. Like, Tatum's a much better pull-up jump shooter. And he is weaponizing his physicality and strength in a way that we haven't seen before from him on the low block. Like, he is getting to that shot. He is taking those shots. And he's opened up a dynamic of his game that's different. But at the end of the day, I just trust Nikola Jokic more in big spots. I trust him to manufacture great offense, to anchor this team, to control the game in a different way that I just don't think Jason Tatum is capable of. And that's what I'm so excited for, man. We're going to make a legend out of two things here. The Nuggets become a bona fide dynasty in the making here by knocking off one of the greatest and most talented teams of all time, or Jason Tatum and the Boston Celtics' reign of terror begins by knocking off one of the greatest players of all time. Like, Mm -hmm. that's why when you say, man, I'm going to feel shortchanged if we don't get it because it is a collision course of two superpowers, man. Nikola Jokic and this great team around him and then this just super team that is the Boston Celtics behind Jason Tatum. It is two titans of the sport. And, yeah, man, I want to see it. I I hope we get it. Um, I I feel like anything less or anything different would be disappointing, would be a a a bit of a letdown this late in the year. Like, I just feel like these teams, and we've said it so many times, so I'm sorry if you're tired of hearing it, these two teams feel like they are just head and shoulders above every other team in their conference. They just sit atop the heap, man. Um, Yeah, it's going to be a battle, man. I I just feel like these are – clearly the two best teams in basketball yeah I think you hit the nail on the head this Boston team is so great that it feels like the entire year the exercise has just been nitpick Boston or compare them exclusively to Denver and it's just understood that they've lapped everybody else and it's not normal how good they are this isn't your average one seed you mentioned the net rating stat just by raw point differential they are fourth all time and they're alongside the 72 Lakers the 71 Bucks, the 96 Bulls, and the 2017 Warriors. Those are four of the most dominant title runs that we have ever seen. Like those are teams that are dropping one game in the case of the Warriors, two games in the case of the Bucks and the Bulls. I think three games in the case of the Lakers, like just running through the playoff field. So I don't want to understate that. I don't want to undersell that. This is the most talented starting five since the peak Warriors by a good bit. And outside of that, might be the most talented starting five this century. There's not been a team with a fifth guy this good. I can tell you that. Shout out Tayshaun Prince. I love him. Like, that's kind of the first guy who comes to mind when you just think about super well-rounded starting lineups. But you're talking about Drew Holiday as the fifth best starter on this team. Drew Holiday like uh, who we consider a clear all-star level guard, even though he's only made it a couple times for the last decade, who is still one of the best defensive players on the planet, period, point blank. It's incredible. And you're getting a better version of Jason Tatum, who's stronger, who's been more effective as a post-up player, who's been on a really good pull-up shooting run. Jalen Brown, post-all-star game, is playing some of his best basketball of his career. 27 points per game on 61% true shooting. And he's been missing a few games as of late with the hand stuff. But he had a run earlier uh, post-All-Star break where, like, he was their best player. He was just absolutely executing everybody. And this version of him, when he is this level of shot maker, hitting over 40% of his threes, is terrifying. How do you even beat the Celtics if you have Jalen Brown playing at that level? Where it's not just, okay, we have a star second shot maker who can bully mismatches who's really good in transition but also isn't the best playmaker might score with average efficiency like if he is going to have all his physical advantages and then also just rain jumpers on you what do you do it's just over like that's the ceiling that this boston team has i still have them at number two because i have a lot of faith in Nikola Jokic, is one of the best players this game has ever seen but what this boston team can do you might just not have an answer for Like, at the end of the day, I really think the Nuggets are a very good team. They're not as loaded a basketball team as the Celtics. And uh, Jokic cannot do literally everything. Like, there are some teams that are just too great, and I don't think it's out of the question that this Boston team is that. And so the people who are still like, nah, 
Boston's going to lose in the East. Yeah, Denver's great, but Boston isn't on that level. I do not agree. I do not agree. I understand the track record. First of all, the track record is lost in Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Finals last year when they were way more talented, but then the year before that, were in the Finals and lost, and they've been the more talented team both those years. They've underachieved, but they've still been damn good. They've still been on the brink of doing it all. And this year, they have the sort of talent that just should put them over the top without a question when you add a Kristaps Porzingis and a Drew Holiday in one offseason and Derek White gets better and Jason Tatum gets better. And now Jalen Brown is playing out of his mind as of late. Defensively, they have four real plus defenders on the perimeter, all of whom... Uh, you cannot attack. You cannot pinpoint any of them, right? The smallest dudes on the floor in that starting five are 6'4 stout elite guards. And so that presents a lot of issues. And then KP may not be the most switchable, but he has been an elite pure rim protector this year and still brings so much length on the interior. Offensively, they are big. They are physical. But they are also highly skilled. As I said defensively, where you can't pinpoint any of their guys, at the same time, because everybody in terms of their perimeter players, is so big and physical relative to their position, they're going to be able to pinpoint your smallest guy and get a good shot. JB and Jalen, particularly, have both been super effective post-up players this year, which generally speaks to specifically mismatch attacking. They're also an insane shooting team. They're by far first in threes made on a 39% clip. They are comfortably first in offensive rating and they're second in defensive rating. Like, this is rare company, bro. This is one of the great regular season teams ever, and especially when you consider the state of things in 2024 where star players do miss more games. Like, we're not going to see a lot of 65-win seasons. I think that's going to become an increasingly rare thing. We haven't seen one since the 2018 Rockets, and that's what the Celtics are going to do. Like, they're just ridiculous, and I do like their depth more than Denver's. I think what we've gotten from Pritchard and Hauser... It's been real quality minutes, and obviously you still have Al Horford as a sixth man who is limited compared to what he used to be, but still an effective, highly intelligent, strong, really good positional defender, stretch big, good passing big. Like, there's still a lot of good value there for him being a bench player. So there are so many things to love about this Boston team where you just wonder, like, am I an idiot for picking anybody to beat them? The reasons they are still number two, number one, as you mentioned, can Tatum consistently play at a superstar level? He does not have to play at the level of Nikola Jokic. He can't play at the level of Nikola Jokic. That's out of the question. His team is just better, though. And if he can play as a fringe top five player, if he is reining his pull-up jumpers, and if he is also being smart about weaponizing his physical advantages, then you just might not be able to stop this Boston team. Like, something has to go wrong. Something has to go a little bit sideways here, or else they're just going to win it. The other question is, can their offensive process hold up in the clutch? And that's a concern that we've seen in previous years. I do think that they have more skill than ever before. They have a big who can break up some of their lulls of settling for tough shots from the perimeter. But I do think they're still going to have to rely on Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown executing as decision makers and shot makers in those crunch time situations, which there's just been questionable moments, but it's been better this year than ever before, like a good bit better in the regular season. So I'm betting on the Nuggets because I know that that is going to be one of the most consistent offenses we have ever seen, led by, in my opinion, the best offensive player ever. And uh, that's a hell of a formula, but you need a hell of a formula to overcome this this Boston team because they're not just regular one seed. They're not regular finals team. These are two of the best teams this century. I legitimately think that. Like, I'm not saying they are the best. Don't conflate the two. Like, this isn't the 2000 and 2001 Lakers. This isn't the 2017 Warriors. But when you're talking about those second tier, like, either one of these teams, I think, would be one of the better champs in the top half this century and certainly should be the best since we saw the peak Warriors. And uh, we're just blessed to see both these teams. And I'm incredibly excited to see if they do face off in the finals. The thing that I think you hit on the head with Boston is something has to go wrong. You mm -hmm. read my mind. I mean, it really feels like their talent advantage is so large that something catastrophic is going to have to happen. Like, they are built to... The thing about this Boston team is, I don't know if they did this intentionally, 
but like they are built to withstand bad games from their stars. Like because of the physical advantage, because of the shooting ceiling that they have, because of just they the have depth... more good players than everybody. Else. Because of the depth of weapons, yeah, man. Yeah. Because if Tatum's not having a good night, oh well, shit, man, I got Jalen Brown. Oh, if Jalen Brown's not having a good night, oh, I got Kristaps. Yeah. Oh, Kristaps isn't having a good night. Let me, you know, it's. How? How did they do this? And and here's the thing about Boston, too. My, my final thing I'll say, if they do slay the dragon, if they do climb the mountain, I, you know, I know that the tax apron thing is coming in with all the contracts, and so I don't know how that's going to mess with Boston's roster construction moving forward front office-wise. To me, if Boston breaks through, it's like, I don't know if, I'm not saying they're going to go on a run and become a dynasty, but it's like, this is, Boston has been on the cusp for what six years now and i know this is through a a, i mean a a bunch of different iterations of their roster they made the conference finals in 2019 so yeah i mean they've been contending that whole time to different extents from isaiah thomas to kyrie irving to tatum and jb like they've just been waiting to break through and once they do it it feels like boston is gonna they're gonna have the ring that can you know finally justify them as you know, top dogs, and I just feel like it's going to take them to another level where Boston is going to be the, you know, the, the front runner every year if they can keep this group together. Um, until we see that I'm not get, betting against the big serve, though, man. There is nothing, and that speaks volumes about the faith that we have in this Denver Nuggets team and Nikola Jokic is a superstar. Like you said, dude, this is the most talented team. I've seen since the Warriors. And I thought the Warriors, I didn't know if anybody could ever touch that. And with the way that we are seeing skill and, and size and athleticism every year through the draft, I mean, maybe we, somebody's probably going to surpass this Boston team one day. I don't know how it's going to happen. You know, I, I don't know. But it's going to happen one day. Mm-hmm. We're, we're just going to be like, man, this team is just full of freaks. Maybe it's OKC down the road, you know? Um, Boston is the most talented team, though. And, and that's why... I just think it speaks volumes about Jokic and how much and how much better he is as the best player in the world that we can still pick him against this bona fide super team. Yeah. But at the end of the day you can pick something and it can be wrong and it's just possible. And, and maybe it's yeah, maybe it's great. Boston's year, man. And and that's another thing is Boston has such a the fans, the, there is a huge chip on Boston's shoulder this year to get it yeah. done because they have been on the cusp every single year, man. Boston has been, I mean, yeah, man, it's been, it's been, it's been six or seven years, dude, of yeah. Boston yeah. hitting their head on the ceiling. Yeah, I misspoke. It was 2018 that they made the conference yeah. finals because, of course, it's Tatum's rookie year. He's still 19. And as you mentioned, they made the year before that with the IT iteration. So, like, that's an entirely different core. But nevertheless, that's a lot of conference finals appearances, man over the course of not even a full decade. So it's crazy if they don't get it done. Like they pretty much have control of this team through next year. So if they don't get it done this would, year or the next, I would be surprised. Eventually as, they're going to get it done. And if they don't, they're one of the best teams to never win it. That's which we can't ask, have that conversation, mm-hmm. obviously, because they're the odds on favorite. Yeah. And the margin between them and Denver in my eyes is super slim. And like I said, they're going to run it back next year. They're going to win a title. So it's probably not even worth having, but like, this they team would be is so damn good. They who, would be. Who do you right now is the best team to not win a title? Is it the Suns? I think we've when had I think this about conversation. not an individual season, but like you had multiple cracks at it, it would be the mid two thousand Suns. But that team wasn't as good as Boston right now because although it's an all time offense, like they were just never at the level defensively where. You probably need to be to win a title, no matter mm-hmm. how good you are offensively. Whereas Boston, it's best offense in the league, and we're elite defensively. And frankly, the defense is what I buy into most with this team. I think it's what's most consistently great. Mm-hmm. God, they are just a juggernaut. But Denver is number one. And there's a few reasons that I have Denver at number one. First of all, Jokic, I think, is the best offensive player ever. And the consistent shot quality that he creates for a team is unparalleled in the league today. And because of that, they have such an excellent half-court process that is not susceptible to much shot variance. We know that this is a very good shooting team from beyond the arc, but they don't need to rain threes 
whatsoever. I've mentioned this stat before, but they won two finals games last year with five threes made. Nobody else won a playoff game with that few threes made because Jokic can get what he wants in and around the paint at all times. Players around him just cut at a level that you don't see elsewhere, so that's more good looks around the rim. Jamal Murray is such a great mid-range shot maker. He doesn't specifically have to rely on the three ball falling, and so that is rare value. This team is also huge, and uh, that mattered in last year's playoff run. Size is, it feels like one of the defining things that we talk about this year. It's such an interesting change in dynamic from when we were in our little small ball stretch of things because now it's such a great era of bigs and there's so many huge players who are also highly skilled. And you're talking about a team who has a stout 6'4 point guard in Jamal Murray and then has a front court with 6'10 MPJ, 6'9 Aaron Gordon, who was just an absolute tank and bounces out the gym, so he plays even bigger than that. And Nikola Jokic, who, again, plays even bigger than his raw height because of his overwhelming weight and his length and just play style, how he bullies you. So offensively, I love the consistency that they have, and I love how they shape up on the glass, and they have been unbelievably good in the clutch because of that reliable shot quality, because a Jokic post-up is always going to get you a good shot. A Jokic Murray pick and roll especially with Aaron Gordon in the dunker spot is always going to get you a good shot they're impervious to coverage Jokic is we saw it throughout last year I've talked about oh you can put uh, another post defender on Jokic to have your best defensive big in the Roma roll maybe that works a little bit it doesn't work enough don't try zone zone doesn't work like there's really nothing that you can do to stop this team from getting good shots and uh they're not going to shoot themselves out of a game in a way that Boston might, even though Boston's shooting ceiling is mostly such a good thing. What I don't want to sell short, though, is how good this team defense is for Denver because that was a big deal in the playoffs last year. They defended their asses off, but they have been better throughout this regular season than last year, like significantly better. And that's part of the reason they've won so many games without having an overwhelmingly great regular season offense. So... That matters to me. Again, they don't have dudes who you can just pinpoint and hunt and attack. You can try with Jamal. He's going to hold up reasonably well in those situations. Aaron Gordon is a pretty damn good option to throw at big wings. KCP is one of the best point of attack defensive guards in basketball. One of the best transition defenders in basketball. Some of the best hands. I love that man. Jokic is not going to be a good conventional rim protector, but he'll make a positive impact in other ways with his hands, with his IQ, his positioning, his rebounding. And collectively, it's a really good unit. So I have so much faith in them. Like, that's what it comes down to. Last year, Boston, you could argue, still had the highest highs of anybody in the playoff field. Like, when they were on, when they were humming, it was just good night, this game is over. Denver, though, every single night hit a level that nobody else could. Night after night after night. That's what you cannot deny about Denver last year. They were the best team in the field, but they were by far the most consistent team in the field. And that floor is because of this consistent offense let out by Jokic and also because of the level that they're bringing consistently on defense, which isn't what Boston can do, but it's still pretty damn good. The one issue that I have with this team, the one red flag really, is their depth. I just think... When Reggie Jackson is playing as he has been as of late, you really worry about bench ball handling. And to be fair, I don't think you're going to have units out there in the playoffs where Reggie Jackson is like dealing with any responsibility as a primary ball handler. I think you're going to have either Jamal or Jokic on the floor at all times. But then it's just like, all right, Reggie Jackson isn't that great of a basketball player outside of that. And he has good stretches, but he also has bad stretches. And then outside of that, Christian Brown, Peyton Watson, I like in stretches. I like the athleticism. I like the shooting for the most part. I like what they can bring defensively. They're both inconsistent. They're not super high impact role players. And so I like what Boston brings to the table a bit more there. And Boston just has more star level players, period, point blank. So you need Jokic to just do what he did last year, basically. Like you need him to be insane to beat Boston. And also you really need Jamal to rise to a hell of a level. Like, that's the other thing. I believe in playoff Jamal with all my heart, but he was great in last year's playoff run, and you need him to be a pretty ridiculous shot maker, I think, if you're talking about knocking off the Celtics. You just need that 
one other source of like consistent high level creation Jokic can create so much great stuff but if you don't have like a really threatening perimeter ball handler then we're talking about beating the Celtics man it's a really high bar that you're held to so those are the couple little things but ultimately again they're the most consistent team when it matters in the clutch they just execute so seamlessly they're so smart they're so disciplined they're so dialed in Boston very well could overwhelm that with raw talent but I'm not going to pick against Denver because this team is a machine. We saw it last year. And I think heading into the playoffs, they're even better this year probably. I think so too. Uh, to speak to that, they're fourth in clutch offensive rating. They're seventh in half-court offensive rating. The Celtics are actually number one in the half-court. But there's a track record thing with this too. And it's like we've seen Boston lose their offensive process and shoot themselves out of games. And we've seen... Denver consistently churn out great offenses. I think you had a key point. I think depth could really matter against this team. Like, Boston just has a lot of talented basketball players. I do like Brown and Watson. I think they're going to be impactful defensively in transition, rebounding, uh, stuff like that. But they are a little limited offensively. And I do think Jamal is going to have to reach that star ceiling. Uh, but we've seen it consistently. He is a playoff riser. He is a gamer. When mm -hmm. you need him to step up, Jamal's going to. And last year, I was super impressed with MPJ, too, man. Big shots. Um, and it, when his shot's off, impacting the game in other ways, crashing the glass, moving the ball, playing defense. I'm not going to pick against the Nuggets until I see it, man. And again, I could be wrong. The Celtics are one of the most talented teams I've ever seen. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Um, but until, it's like I said, man, with Jimmy versus Tatum, and, you know, give me Jimmy until further notice. Give me the big serve until further notice, man. I can't pick against Jokic. If somebody were to run away with the finals, and I don't think anybody could blow the other team out, but that probably means winning in five, I kind of think it would be Boston. I, I just think the ceiling they can reach is higher. Yeah, I think I agree. But for the most part, you're not just going to hit your ceiling game after game after game, and it's going to be about – who can just consistently get their bread and butter shots, who can grind out these tough games, who can survive when things aren't going perfectly. That's what Denver is built to do. And so I can't wait, man. I can't wait. I can't wait for the playoffs. Just yeah, period, dude. point blank. I'm excited. This episode has me jazzed up. It was a long one. We keep going long, guys. We went long with Spawn Hour. We went long today. Hope that you're enjoying it. We're just so excited for the basketball that's going on right now. So, if you want more Nerd Sesh content, you can find a whole lot of it on our YouTube page, all of our full shows, some breakout clips, and some video essays, video breakdowns that we're doing on specific NBA topics. I uh, talked about Wemby versus Jokic last week. I also talked about Paolo Boncaro, just how good is he. Have something else coming this week, so dial in for all that. You can follow us across social, TikTok and Instagram at Nerd Sesh, Twitter at Nerd underscore Sesh. If you want to see all of our trivia content, which is a whole lot of fun, you can listen to the podcast, of course, across audio platforms. You can check out our merch if you want that hat like Logan's got on, if you want the flags behind us at thevolume.com. And you can join our Discord if you want to talk about really anything. We got all sorts of conversations going on in there. Just become part of our community. Could be fun. Matthew Spawn Hour is there. You can rain insults down upon him or do whatever the hell you want. That link is at the link tree across our social media bios. So with that, as always, appreciate you guys. Hope you've enjoyed. I have been Carson Brabber. I have been Logan Camden. And this was Nerd Sash. <laughs> <laughs>